to the glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today on this Sunday, it marks the seventh year exactly, when Patty and I walked into this church on a Sunday the first time. Uh, became your record. We've been here seven years together in cycles of Sundays. It brings to mind not a celebration for us individually, as much as a time to reflect and think about things. Seven years is a perfect number in the Bible, a number that means something special to God. But then again, Marilyn Monroe made a movie called The Seven Year Itch. So we've got to put it in this proper perspective. And maybe you guys are itchy to get rid of us, I don't know. But I do know that we should look back and take account and take reflection. Have we made progress together as a church family? Today is a grand day, first day of a program year. When the service is over, there'll be a big presentation by the rector over Memorial Hall about the Kingdom Church, and what it means for us to be a Kingdom Church. But are we really being that? Are we stepping out the way we should to become the voice of God and the witness of the world that we need to be? We have a gospel today that speaks of dramatic changes. A child who was possessed by a demon was freed and released. A man who could not speak or hear was able to do both after his encounter with Jesus. Great changes, transformations taking place. But has our church likewise transformed? And to get really personal and to give you something as a takeaway for your week, have you changed? And not just in the last seven years, but the last one year, three years, five years, 30 years. Are you still the same person you've been all this time? Has your faith deepened? Have you come into a nearer and dearer relationship with your Savior Christ? Or are you kind of where you are? You're one of those punch clock Christians and you come on Sunday, and you attend it and you go out to lunch when it's over and it feels good and you're trying to get the best of it, but you haven't really immersed yourself in a transforming effort with the Lord. Some people think they're stuck. Some people think I'm stuck where I am. I, I know you want me to change. I've tried to change things. I'm where I am. I can't be any better. Well, that's not true. You can always transform, not by your effort, but by your surrender. The good news is the changing and transformation isn't hard work for you. It's all the work of the Lord. All you have to do is present yourself. And if you're willing to do that and walk and take the hard times with it, you'll be all right. You see, many people are afraid of change. They're afraid of transformation because they don't want to go through the discomfort and the adjustments that are involved. Well, you know, I could change and become a deeper Christian, but I don't want to have to serve at the church. I don't want to have to go visit people in a hospital. I sure as heck don't want to give more money. You know, whatever it is, that's our excuse. But we don't like the discomfort that comes from change in church or anywhere else in our lives. At home, at work, in the community, we kind of want things to stay simple. And not everyone. Some people are energized by change. I'm one of them. Change energizes me. And it's not like I'm willy-nilly out there to change, but when I see the Lord doing something new, I get excited because I know his words from the Old Testament where he says, I make all things new. And that's exciting. That's wonderful. I make all things new, including me, including you, including this church, including the world. He makes things new. We have a God who created it, and he can recreate it, and he can fix it and redeem it and transform it by his power because of who he is and what he is. But here's an important thing for everybody here. This is something you're really going to have to measure yourself against if you're going to get anything out of today's sermon and walk into the week with it. There are two kinds of changes that we're talking about. One is a change of circumstances. The other is a change of you. And people will confuse them, or people will want the one and avoid the other. Oh Lord, you know, please give me a new job. Instead of praying, oh Lord, will you help me to persevere in the job, up job I'm in? Changes of circumstance are not always changes of person. Some people avoid changes of circumstance. I had a missionary tell me one time years ago that people in the third world are different than us here in America. The missionary said, you and I will pray to avoid difficult circumstances. We want to be sanitized of anything that's hard and uncomfortable where the people of the third world will pray, Lord, make me strong to endure the difficult circumstance. They ask for the change for themselves, not for the change of the circumstance. And when I find myself praying for changes of circumstance, sometimes it's okay and appropriate, but usually it's because I'm weaseling out. It's usually because I want to take the easier way. Oh, I don't want to go through this, Lord, please don't put me through this, change it. But I'm here to witness to you that the most profound changes in my character 
and my being and my walk with God and my nearness to my Savior and my faith have come when the circumstances were the hardest. Circumstances that never in a million years would I want to have visit my life. Yet by having walked through them, I came out on the other side stronger, wiser, more able, less afraid, able to encourage others who are now facing it themselves and thanking God that he used that to improve me and to transform me more into the likeness of his son. Everyone here can give witness and testimony to that. When I was a kid, I went through this really hard thing. Oh, what happened? Well, I came out strong on the other side. Not always the case. Sometimes you come out wrecked on the other side. I get that, but we should examine that as to why that happens as well. These are important things. Consider this deaf man, this speechless man in the gospel today. Consider the little girl who was possessed by the demon. Jesus released both of them. The demon comes out of the little girl. The man can hear and now speak. I wish we had another chapter on each one of them. Did the change of their circumstance affect the change of their character? The change of their relationship with God? Who they were by way of holiness, by way of sacrifice, service, all the things we're called to do in the Christian life? Because you can go through them and miss the blessing. You can go through the experience and miss the blessing. I always say, if you're going to go through something brutal, at least don't come out empty-handed. Come out with the fruit of it. Come out with the blessing of it which might be the wisdom, the strength, the character, the encouragement, whatever it is you gain of it. But don't go through a hard time and come out with nothing. Life-changing transformation, as I said, doesn't require that you do hard work. Well, you have to be obedient, I get that. God's gonna do the transformation, but it requires that you surrender. It requires that you trust God, that you take your hands off the steering wheel, let him do the steering for a while, that you start walking with God in obedience rather than calling the shots. A.W. Tozer was a theologian who wrote a lot of very wise things over a hundred years ago. And he wrote this one. I, I read it for you. He said, the reason why so many people are still troubled, still seeking, still making little forward progress in their faith life is because they have not yet come to the end of themselves. I love that phrase. Have not come to the end of themselves. We'll catch up to that. We are still trying to maintain control and to interfere with God's work within us. Coming to the end of ourselves, giving up control, and letting God do what he wants in us, there's our problem. What does it mean that you haven't come to the end of yourself? It means you're still worried about you and your ego and your self-centric, egocentric life, right? God is saying, submit yourself to me. You know the scriptures, I was crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ lives in me. To wake up every morning praying that God will put you to death so that you can walk in Christ. These are the things that help us to put death to self that Christ may live in us. I was talking to the group earlier and I told them again about my practically daily prayer before I get out of bed. Asking God to put me to death so I can be a good Christian soldier for him. A good disciple of Jesus. Praying, Lord, bend me, break me, shake me, twist me, mold me, kick me, hammer me. Put me in a fire. Do whatever you have to do. But don't let me be the way I am. Let me be more like your son. Because unless I'm seeking those changes and I'm submitting myself and surrendering and trusting him to change me and do that, I'm never going to get to where I need to go for him, for myself, or for you. And the same thing is true for every person here. We have to submit ourselves in those ways. In 2 Corinthians, it says this. All of us reflect the glory of the Lord. Why not? We're God's children, right? And that same glory that comes from the Lord, who is the Holy Spirit, it transforms us into his likeness and an ever greater degree of glory. An ever greater degree of glory. It's the Holy Spirit who transforms us into his likeness. We're already in glory. We're children of God. But we're on our path. We're being sanctified, built up, made different. And when we surrender to the Holy Spirit, our lives can change. There's nothing in your life he cannot change. He can change anything you're bearing or carrying or wearing with you. God is adamant over and over again in the scriptures that he can change us. And not only can he change us, he longs to do it. He doesn't want us to be broken and twisted and scared and worried and, and angry at ourselves and frustrated and constantly disappointed. He wants us to live in joy and fullness and robust glory to fulfill everything he ever planned for us. That's what he wants us to do. Max Lucado, the contemporary Christian writer, wrote this. You all know the Wizard of Oz and Dorothy, right? Well, they wrote this. 
He said, the Wizard of Oz told Dorothy to look inside yourself and find yourself. But God says, look inside yourself and find the Holy Spirit. Looking inside for yourself may get you to Kansas, but looking inside for the Holy Spirit will get you to heaven. Now, take your pick. Uh, it's true. If you're so egocentric that you're all about you, you're never going to get off the mark. But when you're looking for God, you'll make your way. And you say, well, of course I'm looking for God, here I am. But let me warn you against yourself. Coming to church every week is a wonderfully good thing. But you can hide in religion. I've told you this before. You can mask all your problems and mask all your needs by saying, well, I'm being a good Christian. I'm coming, I'm giving, I'm serving. Religion is not Jesus. I, I hate religion. He said, what do you mean you hate religion? I like the true religion that the Bible speaks of, that kind of religion I like. But the idea of religious repetitive things that gain your way to heaven or prove you're good, that's nonsense. What makes me better is that I love Jesus and he's in my heart and the Holy Spirit's changing me. The religion is just some kind of legalistic pattern I follow, but the transformation of spirit and heart come when I surrender to him. You cannot be in a true and right relationship with Christ and not change. If you are in a good relationship with him, you're going to change. Just like if you're in a true relationship with the devil, you're going to change that way. You lay with dogs, you catch fleas. You hang around with good people, you do good things. And being with the Lord Christ on a daily basis in your prayer, and your walk, and your soul will lead you to a place of goodness. If you're stuck after many, many years, there's a good chance you have not fully surrendered. If you're stuck, you're probably still saying, well, I'll go this far with you, Jesus, but not completely. It's that example I've given you before, that everybody loves for Jesus to be their Savior. Oh, it's great when he gets up on the cross and dies for me. It's great that I get eternal life. It's great I get forgiveness of my sins. It's great. I want him to be my Savior. But he's your Lord and Savior. And people say, but I don't want him to be my Lord. Then he's going to tell me what to do. I want to run my own life. Well, guess what got you where you are, running your own life, making your own decisions, walking the ways of the world. When we turn to him, it gets different. Consider this deaf and speechless man in the gospel today. The man comes up to Jesus, deaf and speechless. But what we have to do is say, how does that translate to me? I can speak and I can hear. So what is, what is that? Just another example of Jesus' great wondrous acts, his miraculous acts. No, no. Remember that in all of Jesus' miracles and all of Jesus's parables the physical things he do, does are for spiritual lessons for you and me you know that thing I tell you about behind everything ordinary there's something divine and healing a man of his lack of hearing and lack of speech is hardly ordinary but it's physical isn't it it's a physical correction that Jesus made but he's trying to show you and me that I am spiritually deaf I am spiritually tongue-tied sometimes. And he wants to heal me of it by laying his hands on me and you the way he laid his hands on this man in the gospel story. The way he freed the little girl of the demon by laying hands on her. He wants to heal us that way. The deaf man is you and me without the touch of Christ that plagues us. The healed man and the healed little girl is you and me after we allow Jesus to have his way with us. And we become that way. When you think of the incredible fact that the first thing that that man heard when Jesus opened his ears was the voice of Jesus himself. He said, wow, wouldn't that be amazing? It is amazing for you and me too. Although that man physically heard Jesus' voice, the day that our ears open up to the truth of the gospel, the day that our tongues open up to say out loud what the love of God is to somebody who needs to hear it, that's when we also hear him in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. And let's face it, when you die and go to heaven, you're going to hear him there anyway. You will hear that as the first voice when you wake up from your death, and there he is, and you're with him. Those things will come to you. The words that jump off the page for me in this teaching are two. Jesus sighed. If you'll notice that before he healed the man of his deafness, he was about to pray, and it says, he sighed. Oh. Now, he also sighs for the mourners over Lazarus in the Lazarus story. He sighs to see the mourning, and they're all crying, and it hurts him. It's not a sigh of annoyance. It's not a sigh of fatigue. It's the sigh of the compassion of the Lord God who looks at us and says, little children are not supposed to be born deaf. 
and speechless and blind and disease-ridden and to have cancer. Neither are the older children of God like you or me. The world's not supposed to be broken. There's not supposed to be hurricanes. There's not supposed to be violence. There's not supposed to be any of these things that makes life so hard. And he's sighing because he knows we're going through it. And he loves us so much. It's like, oh, Father, before I pray this, this is just yet another one that's breaking my heart. We too are to be that way. We heard uh, Catherine read the wonderful lesson from James over there a little while ago. And James was giving instructions about the poor and saying that the, the love of us and of God, the love of Christ in us, overflows to the poor as we do things for the poor and we help them. The world was not meant to be broken and chaotic, and nor is the poor meant to, or are they meant to be around us that way. We are to bring the love of Christ to them. Um, my wife Patty likes the phrase, you know you have it right when the things that break God's heart also break your heart. Likewise, you know you have it right when the things that make Jesus sigh are the things that make you sigh. And finally, you're, you're walking in that pattern. You've been transformed. You've come fully over to the way he is. When Jesus sighed, he said to the deaf man, Be open, Ephrathah! And his ears were open, his tongue was loosened, and he heard and he spoke. How does that relate to you and me personally? We are deaf to so much of what God has to say to us. We're spiritually deaf. We are speechless to so much of what God wants us to say in His holiness and His love to others. And when we are deaf, we fail to speak. And when, when we are speechless, we fail to speak. When we're deaf, we fail to hear. And God wants us to have our ears open, to have our tongues open, so we can fully love and be the way He intended for us to be. This whole question of being transformed, this whole question of transformation comes down to that man named Jesus, comes down to the Son of God, the Lord God, Jesus. You can't transform yourself, save yourself the trip. Instead, humble yourself, offer yourself to the, to the Lord, stop taking control. That quote I gave you before about Tozer, saying we have to come to the ends of ourselves, it's time for us to come to the end of ourselves, to give up the control and stop interfering with God's work within us and instead walk with it, take it, absorb it when it's uncomfortable and come out the other side as a new person in the image of Christ. That's about the greatest lesson we can hope to get from the gospel. And for it, we say thanks be to God and amen. Amen.